So, you know, it really is an iterative process, which you see illustrated here with the, the colors lighting up, I guess, if you will. But once we get through that whole process, uh, maybe a couple iterations of it, we can combine all that information to derive what we refer to as the hydrologically reconditioned DEM, or commonly what we refer to as the hydro DEM. So basically what the hydro DEM is, is it's combining all those components of the reconditioning and the non-contributing analysis to determine, uh, well, to derive a DEM that can determine hydrologic characteristics that are reflective of the landscape um, as you would actually see in the field. So if we think about what the hydrologic cycle actually consists of, this is kind of a cool little graphic we've been able to find, but um, basically what we're we're trying to account for a much, as much of this cycle as we can um, through the lidar information and the processing that we've talked about to date. Um, you've got things such as depression storage that we're trying to account for with our non-contributing analysis. Again, our precipitation we're trying to account for some of that depressional storage with the non-contributing analysis. The hydro DEM is going to allow you to determine things such as overland flow. Um, and ultimately what the stream flow looks like for your particular watershed and as well as determining where your drainage divides are between those major stream flows. So when we take a look at a hydro DEM on a large scale, now the graphic you see illustrated here is something where we're delineating subbasins anywhere from 20 to 40 scale, square miles for a, a very large scale hydrologic modeling application where it was actually a developing HEC HMS models across the Red River Basin. And here you see we've got subbasins to a very large scale. We've got non-contributing areas that were determined using a high volume of runoff or a uh, TR60 10 day run or 100 year 10 day runoff, which in this particular area varied anywhere from five and a half to over six inches of runoff produced in the landscape. That yielded the non contributing areas that you see hatched in red there. Uh, the flow pads were then derived from the reconditioning that was applied to the DEM. Those flow pads were used to uh, do things such as hydrologic routing. So getting runoff from one subbasin to points further downstream. If we look at a much finer scale, this is an application where we did some reconditioning um, for BMP prioritization. And for those particular type of applications, usually we're most concerned about how do we define where the overland flow is coming from before it gets to a channel. So in those particular instances, we're typically looking at things at uh, what you refer to as the field scale or a very fine scale before it actually gets to a defined in-channel area. Um, reason being that typically for those type of projects, the interest is how do we quantify things such as sediment and phosphorus coming off the landscape or at least at least rank different areas depending on the, the likelihood that erosion may or may not occur at those particular locations. So with a really fine scale hydrologically reconditioned DEM we can divide things such as what you see on your screen here where the yellow polygons depict what we would call our overland catchments or, or the drainage areas that, that feed an in-channel area. Um, the, the green triangles that you see illustrated there are at the actual outlet points for overland flow or the locations where those yellow areas outlet into a defined in-channel area. And then we can also take a look at things like what is the flow characteristics within that particular overland catchment, which is the thin blue lines. Um, so we can take a look at things like how is flow actually accumulating within that particular um, overland catchment. And if we know how the flow is accumulating within that overland catchment, we can further prioritize based on where specifically in that overland catchment would you want to place something like a side inlet structure or um, a sediment control basin or things of that nature to, to, to really try and get the best benefit um, on the landscape for investing funds in those type of practices. One thing I did want to touch on here, um, when you're working with reconditioned data sets. And one thing that's becoming increasingly more common within the state of Minnesota is that you already have a base reconditioned DEM to start with. Uh, for example, in uh, the Red River Valley, the Minnesota portion will be covered with a uh, hydrologically reconditioned DEM as part of the um, Fargo-Moorhead Metro project and the Corps of Engineers Red River Basin Feasibility Study. 
um, completing development of HEC HMS models across the Red River Basin. They're actually going through and reconditioning the DEM to produce those models, or produce sub-basins as inputs for those models. So that's a base data set that will be available. Through the Bowser Clean Water Fund um, process, there's been numerous grants that have been awarded uh, through the last few years, which have allowed um, local government units to actually get involved with this reconditioning process for BMP prioritization. The reconditioning for those data sets in many instances is made available for anyone to download and pick up and use. Um, but one thing you really do have to consider when you're using a reconditioned data set is you have to really think about what are you trying to accomplish by using this reconditioned data set versus what the user that originally did the reconditioning was using that data set for. Um, depending on the use of that data set, um, it may or may not meet the criteria that that you've uh, you know set forth for uh, determining your re or the criteria that you set forth for uh, your end purpose uh, of using the reconditioned data set. And what you see here is just a graphic that we've put together here at Houston. It's by no means a uh, there's nothing saying that this is a standard way of ranking reconditioning, but it's just one way of looking at it where you have a fine scale where you may have reconditioned down to a very small uh, threshold for um, user QA, QC during the reconditioning process, um, all the way up to a really coarse scale, which would maybe correlate more to large scale sub basin delineations, such as trying to delineate HUC 10s or HUC 8s or something of that nature. So again, it's just something you really need to be concerned about as you pick up a data set that may have already been reconditioned and making sure that it's consistent or at least at least to the same uh, level that you require to meet your end goal. Now this is an example of where we're at now within the Red River Basin. Um, I had mentioned that you know they're going through a process to develop uh, hydrologic models across the Red River Basin, which should be wrapping up here uh, sometime this summer. Um, Basically, the southern portion of the basin has been complete. Those data sets are available through the RRBDN website. The northern basin will be complete shortly here. Basically, they're reconditioning the DEM to develop large-scale hydrologic models. So, you know, if we go back to the, the reconditioning scale that I had presented on the previous slide, if I were to throw my rank at it, I would say you, you're getting to a a fairly fine scale, definitely not as fine as some of the work that's being done for BMP prioritization um, on the Minnesota side where we're getting down to that field scale, but it's definitely a good starting point to jump off from, you know, if you're if you're looking to um, use reconditioning in this particular region. And again, you know, there's various locations across the state of Minnesota where reconditioning has been completed outside of the Red River Basin as well. So in terms of applications, once we've developed the Hydro DEM, um, there, it really is, there's, there's a numerous amount of applications. I'm sure there's a lot of applications, things out there that people are using the reconditioned DEM for that, you know, we're definitely not using it for at Houston. And, um, you know, there's probably a lot, in a lot of instances, things that people could be using it for that somebody just hasn't thought of a applicable workflow that would, um, that, that would work for the Hydro DEM under under certain instances. Now this particular graphic you see here, this is probably the most obvious use of the Hydro DEM is developing your watershed hydrography or determining what your flow paths actually look like. Things like where the non-contributing areas in relation to defined channels, how does that relate to the, the contributing watershed along those defined channels. Um, just kind of your basic uh, H and H applications, I guess, the deriving subbasins and things of that nature. Um, you can see another delineation or another graphic here of a watershed delineation with non-contributing areas. Um, one thing we've been using it for in terms of the hydrologic modeling side of things is once we have the hydro DEM and we know accurate uh, flow accumulation characteristics, we can then relate that to things like land use and slope to determine what our estimated travel time is across that watershed and then that helps us in developing um, input parameters for hydrologic models. Um, when we get more into the water quality uh, BMP prioritization side of things, the stream power index is a very um, very popular application now in the state of Minnesota where 
you know, once we have an accurate uh, hydro DEM that can determine upland flow path characteristics, we can then relate that to slope and determine the likelihood of erosion to occur at different locations on the landscape. Um, here's another graphic that you can see of some BMP prioritization applications that we've done. Basically, it shows uh, flow paths across the landscape. Um, the overland flow characteristics ranked from green to red based on likelihood for erosion to occur at a given location. Um, other things, you know, other potential applications that you could use the hydro DEM for. We haven't gotten a lot into this yet, but it's something we're really kind of starting to play around with a little more. But things such as, you know, using the hydro DEM to prioritize potential wetland restoration, like WRP type projects and that type of thing, to try and locate where do you have those big, um, shallow, broad marshes that were maybe ditched 50 years ago. How do you determine where those locations are at the landscape? And then once you have those locations with the Hydro DEM, how can you kind of rank those locations to not only provide the environmental benefits of restoring those particular wetland complexes, but also how can you select the ones for prioritization that best give you some flood damage reduction features as well? And, you know, we've touched on this throughout the presentation, but development of hydrologic models. Um, this just shows an illustration of the wild rice watershed district in Minnesota where we developed a hydrologic model using reconditioned LIDAR data to derive subbasins and also characteristics for um, hydrologic routing from one subbasin outlet to another. You can see that illustrated on the map here. And really, like I had touched on at the beginning of the presentation, there really is a seemingly endless lists of applications for using a hydro DEM as long as you can relate something to the physical characteristics of flow to accumulate on the landscape um, really you can usually find some way to to have some value in a hydro DEM so with that again I'd like to thank everyone for listening to uh, the presentation today on hydro DEM basics how and why to recondition again my name is Zach Herman with Houston engineering out of our Fargo office uh, you see the email on the screen. Feel free to uh, shoot me an email with any questions or comments that you may or may not have about the presentation. Thanks.